Calling the November 9th Board of Education meeting to order. Do we have any comments from the public on closed session items? We have one member of the public. Okay, if you have a comment, please put your first and last name in the chat and the topic that you would like to speak about. All right, we will close the chat and adjourn to closed session. All right, we are reconvening at 6.05. Um, next item up is the public hearing on um, the California Voters Rights Act redistricting. Um, so we will now open the public hearing. Oh, there he is. Hello, everyone. Just give me a moment to share my screen. Okay. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Is that visible for everyone? That's great. Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Brandon Lalonde, and I'm an attorney with Fagan, Friedman, and Fulfrost, uh, the, the firm that's assisting the district with its transition to a by trustee area election system. Uh, tonight is the second of two pre-map public hearings. So if anyone joined us for the last pre-map public hearing, this is going to pretty much be the same presentation. But again, I'll be here to answer any questions at the end. And the real purpose of tonight is to get feedback from the community on particular communities of interest that they would like to see kept together or any other uh, information that we could get from, from the public that I myself nor the demographer would know as we do not live in the district. Um, before we get into uh, the, the public comments on specific communities of interest, I think it's important first to, uh, to talk about what the California Voting Rights Act is. Um, this is a law that took effect in January of 2003, and it prohibits the use of an at-large election system, which is what the district currently has, when that election system either impairs the ability of a protected class to elect candidates of its choice, or its ability to influence the outcome of an election. And as we discussed last time, this is an extremely low bar and uh, plaintiffs that have brought CBR, CBRA claims against school districts and other public entities have been very successful um, because of that low bar. Uh, one of the reasons for this low bar is that, that sorry, what was that? Um, one of the reasons for the low bar is that the California Voting Rights Act does not require any showing of intent. So it's much easier for a plaintiff to bring a claim against a government entity than the federal counterpart. Um, there is no, no showing of intent on the part of the voters or the elected officials to discriminate against a member of a protected class. Another uh, hurdle that public entities face is that plaintiffs have a right to attorney's fees under the CBRA and expert witness fees. Um, and these can, uh, these can end up being rather large sums. Uh, for example, in Santa Monica, uh, recently there has been over $10 million spent in the litigation that's now before the California Supreme Court. Um, and if the district is successful in defending against a CBRA claim, they are not entitled to the same attorney's fees or expert fees. 
So it's a one-sided provision in the law. So now that we've talked about when the at-large election system is not allowed, let's look at what the district is transitioning to, which is a bi-trustee area election system. This is the only safe harbor from a CBRA claim, meaning that the district cannot be sued under the CBRA once it has this bi-trustee area election system. Uh, for this sort of system, the school district is divided into trustee areas, and then the governing board member is elected from each trustee area and only by the registered voters in that particular area, trustee area where the governing board member resides. So it's a little bit different than the at-large system where the entire board is elected by the entire community at large. So the current step in the process, uh, we're at the pre-map stage, and this is uh, prior to the demographer preparing trustee area maps. Uh, we're here to receive community input and comments and public testimony concerning the composition of the trustee areas associated with the district's transition and any other comments that uh, the district or the community feels is important for us to know. Uh, some examples of what we're looking for here tonight is I would like to keep neighborhood X and neighborhood Y in the same trustee area, uh, or I would like a particular area to be divided amongst the trustees so that it has more representation. Um, for example, I think the 101 or McDowell Boulevard would make sense as a trustee area because they seem like a natural boundary or it just makes sense geographically. Now, after the pre-map public hearings, uh, which end tonight, the uh, demographer will start on the, uh, the map drawing uh, section of our process. Uh, the demographer will use the 2020 census data and additionally permitted updated data uh, in drawing the maps and the population must be equal as practicable. And we're looking at people, not necessarily citizens uh, for, for this aspect. Uh, the education code requires, again, that the population be uh, nearly equal as practicable. And there's a certain amount, which is 10% deviation between the largest trustee area and the smallest trustee area, which is something that the demographer will be looking at because that is a bright line rule in the law. Other criteria that the demographer must consider is that the, uh, the maps must comply with the US constitution, uh, must comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, that the voting district shall be geographically contiguous, that they shall protect local communities of interest, emphasize geographical compactness, and importantly, cannot favor or discriminate against an incumbent, political candidate, or political party. Um, importantly, it's, uh, this process does not change the overall district boundaries, and this is not not about attendance boundaries, and it does not govern how, or it does not change how the district is governed. Uh, each board member, regardless of the trustee area in which he or she resides, still owes a duty to the entire district, and it's still one district with common goals and challenges. And it's just important to emphasize that uh, so that the public and the trustees uh, understand that this is not something that changes either the attendance boundaries or the overall district boundaries. Now looking forward at the schedule, we're here on the second gray um, public hearing, which is pre-map public hearing two, and we're gonna be moving downward towards the uh, red public hearings. The first is scheduled for November 30th, and this will be the first map public hearing. The second will be December 11th. Uh, the third will be December 14th. And importantly, the November 30th and December 11th will be special board meetings. And I'm here to take questions um, if the trustees want to open it up for public comment. Do you want to have any questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Brandon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, in your experience, uh, is there any value to having the district boundaries align with attendance, school attendance boundaries? That's something that the demographer can look at. Sometimes it's impossible because the way that the 
uh, census blocks are broken up. But if that's something that, that the district would like to see, I can definitely pass that along to the demographer. And there's also tools that are able to kind of do a map overlay that will show the uh, CVRE trustee area boundaries and how those interact with the attendance boundaries. No other questions? Do we have any comments from the public on this? Okay, we'll open the chat on this. If you have a comment about, um, about this item, the public hearing on redistricting, go ahead and put your first and last name in the chat. We'll leave it open for about a minute. While we're waiting for comments, I'll go ahead and read our uh, language for public comment, which will apply to all public comment periods. Um, under Government Code Section 54954.3a, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest, providing it relates to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. While Government Code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, program services, and or employees, the district does have a policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. If the comment is about something that is not on the agenda, it will be heard only during the public comment on non-agendized items period. Once that part of the meeting is over, comments will only be taken on agenda items during the discussion of those items. The board values public comments, and although we cannot take action or discuss items not on the agenda, we listen carefully and appreciate input from the public. Public comments are subject to a four minute per person limit or 20 minute limit per subject matter. Additionally, a public speaker can be cut off for exceeding the allotted time or for willfully causing an actual disruption to the meeting. Before cutting a person off or removing someone, the board will give at least one clear warning. If you were cut off or warned last time, please consider that your warning. You can also submit your input in writing by email or other means to the superintendent, board members, or other designated staff. Okay, do we have any, go I ahead, we, I think we can close the, close the chat. We have two comments. We have two, two people, there are three comments, but two, two people. So the first one is Constantine Serafimescu. All right. So first question was, how many subdivisions will be created as a result of this exercise when you are redrawing the map? Hello, Constantine. Uh, we're going to uh, divide the district into five trustee areas. Okay. And my second question was, when would the new system start being in place? Uh, well, if we're able to follow the schedule, which we're hoping to be able to, um, this will be in place at the end of 2021 and will start taking effect with the 2022 elections. Okay, so that means the end of the year, the November. That's uh, well, December, we're hoping that with that last public hearing that was listed, that mm -hmm. that will finish up the process, at least on the district's end. And then there will have to be a waiver and other things submitted to the county, mm -hmm. uh, which will be well in advance of the 2022 elections, which is when this will start. Okay, so basically that's the, when the current district, the, the board will be literally dismissed and we will have to have new elections for five new members, correct? That's gonna depend on uh, the, the sequencing and where the board members are placed. But uh, regardless of that, 
uh, the board members will serve out their term, um, even oh. if there is multiple board members in each trustee area. Okay, okay. That, so that'll, basically... that'll make more sense once we have the maps in front of us at the, at the next public hearing. Okay, okay. So we'll, it will be a process. It's not like immediate dismissal. It's going to be right. serve your own term because you've been a public elected official and then as we'll, we'll transition gradually to the new system. Right. There's a chance that all five trustee area trustee members are in their own trustee area, in which mm -hmm. case uh, there would be no change and there would just be elections based on uh, the trustee areas. And then there may be situations where one or two, two or more trustees are in a particular trustee area in which case um, it's a little bit more difficult, but we can address that if we see it. Okay, thank you, appreciate the help. Thanks, Constantine. Our second uh, second person here is Genevieve Foster with a comment. Hi, good evening. I just would like a clarification of the word that is used, the word is attendance, and how that word is defined in this context. Sure, thanks Genevieve. Um, the reason that we say this doesn't affect attendance boundaries is that this doesn't affect where students go to school. Um, the only thing that this is affecting is the, the process by which the trustees are elected and um, for the community at large, which trustee they will be able to vote for. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon. I think we can close the public hearing. Those are all the comments we have. All right, thank you very much. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, moving on, adoption and approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? I move to adopt and approve the agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, student recognition, students of the month. November 2021 for Kenilworth, Petaluma Junior, Casa Grande, Petaluma High School, and students of the semester for Mary Collins School at Cherry Valley. So Ashley and Dave, I'll let you guys uh, bring them up in whatever order makes sense for you. Hello, uh, my name is Preston Stewart and I'm the uh, student body president at Kenworth Senior High School. And Preston, we can't hear you. Hello, does this sound better? Okay, perfect. Uh, hello, my name is Preston Stewart and I'm the student body president at Kenilworth Junior High School. And I'm here to introduce um, the student of the month, which is Aaron Vandery. Aaron has been chosen for student of the month by her teachers because of her incredible hard work this school year, her excellent self-advocacy skills and her personal dedication to her own success. Aaron's, teacher have, Aaron's teachers have been impressed with her personal growth Aaron has shown in eighth grade. Ms. Chavez shared, Aaron has made so much progress this year. She participates in class, is willing to help her peers, self-advocates, really thinks through problems, and uses her strategies before asking questions. 
She's great at problem solving and is building confidence each day. I appreciate her thoughtful contributions to class discussions and enjoy seeing her humorous side. It's been great to see her thrive this year. In science, Ms. Hancock says, Erin is flourishing as a science student. She is developing confidence and participating more regularly in class. Ms. Rudder, Erin's math teacher, says, Erin is amazing. She is a great team player, always willing to help and work with others. She has no hesitation to ask or answer questions. Her motivation to do well is inspiring. Keep up the hard work, Erin. It is certainly paying off. Erin has shared that her favorite subject is math, and she finds the challenge of the material enjoyable. Erin said Miss Rudder makes the class a great experience. Erin has earned a 3.5 GPA through her diligence and dedication this year. Erin's hobbies include participating in cosplay, which is the act of dressing, dressing up as a character from a movie, book, or video game. She likes to go out with friends dressed up and says that it's really fun to see what everyone comes up with. Erin's creativity and imagination will serve her well in her future goals. Erin plans to attend Casa Grande for high school and then likely will attend the Santa Rosa Junior College to begin her college career. Erin's mom is very proud of her, and she shared, Erin is a good kid who needs to give herself credit for her hard work. Distance, distance learning was challenging, and it's like a light bulb went off this year, and she is excelling. It's wonderful to see. Erin's resilience and resolve to be successful is, is impressive. We are all proud of you, Erin. Congratulations, Erin, for your accomplishments. Uh, hi, I'm Tate Allen. I'm an eighth grader at Kenilworth. Uh, Kenilworth Junior High School is proud to introduce our November Student of the Month, Braden Machika. Braden has been chosen as Student of the Month because he is an academically excellent student, exceptional campus citizen, and one of our best student role models. Braden's teachers all noted how respectful and kind Braden is. Ms. Faye, Braden's PE teacher, shared, Braden is a hard worker who always puts his best effort forth no matter the challenge. He is kind, respectful, and helpful. Ms. Rudder, Braden's math teacher, supported this sentiment as she says he's always ready to learn and work. He's a positive and constantly has a smile on his face, even though I can't see it with the mask. A great kid and student. Ms. Hancock, Braden's science teacher, shared, Braden is a conscientious and hardworking student. He's a great lab partner and classmate. And Ms. Farrell, Braden's English teacher, has been very impressed with Braden stating he's an absolute pleasure to have in class. He's a conscientious student who brings his best to class every day. Braden has been an outstanding role model and a wonderful collaborator. Braden is a basketball enthusiast and enjoys watching games with his two younger brothers at home. Braden plays the sport as often as he can and after attending Casa Grande for high school, he has dreams of playing for UCLA and eventually the NBA. Braden's dad shared that Braden is an awesome kid all around. He is very helpful at home and has always been a very caring person. Braden's family is proud of him and knows he just how deserving he is of this recognition. Braden's favorite class at Kenilworth is English. He enjoys the competitions the students are able to engage in with the other English classes and likes to work on strengthening his writing skills. Braden excels in every class and has a 4.0 GPA to prove it. Braden is a fantastic person and an excellent student. Kenilworth is proud to call him a Colt. Congratulations, Braden, for your accomplishment. Thank you both very much and congratulations to Aaron and Brayden. Looks like we have Petaluma Jr. up next. Rest. Hi, I'm Dana Rocca. I'm the assistant principal at Petaluma Junior. McKenna, do you want to start? Hi, I'm McKenna Treader, and on behalf of Petaluma Junior High, we are honored to present Deshaun Jordan as one of our November 2021 Student of the Month. Deshaun was born in nearby Santa Rosa on December 18th in 2006. 
He's an all-around excellent student, athlete, and citizen, and one who always presents a can-do attitude. When asked about his goals, Deshaun's response was to do better than the day before, even if it's just by a little. Deshaun enjoys school, works hard, and earns good grades. He's a responsible young man who is committed to doing well and helping his friends do better, too. His teachers are impressed with Deshaun's personal worth ethic and his history teacher comments. Deshaun is a wonderful person, not just a great student. He is a leader now and will continue to hold himself and others to accountable to the highest standards. He's brilliant and I'm very glad to have him this year. His English teacher also adds, Deshaun is a constantly diligent and thorough worker. He does his task with intention, mindfulness, and accuracy, always going above and beyond, especially in his analysis. Additionally, he is kind and works well with others. I have been extremely impressed with Deshaun's integrity and motivation. This award is not the first time Deshaun has been recognized for his academic efforts. At his former school in Runner Park, he earned a well-deserved title of hardest worker for his class. Basketball is also a very big part of Deshaun's life. Although Deshaun always puts homework first, he practices as often as possible, supplementing his training with running, sprinting, and weight workouts. As a seventh grader, he earned the coach's award for basketball. On top of his homework and exercise regimens, Deshaun sometimes does work for a family friend. His mother had this to add. I'm so happy to see Deshaun do his best. Deshaun is driven for success and he works hard, has a positive attitude from the time he gets up until the time he goes to bed. He does his schoolwork and practices his favorite sport, basketball. He's kind to others and always does what is asked. I couldn't be prouder. Deshaun is a focused, kind, intelligent young man, and it is a pleasure to have at Petaluma Junior High. We are happy to present him with one of our November 2021 Student of the Month Awards. And I love that Deshaun's entire basketball team is there celebrating with him. Good job, guys. Ivy. <laughs> We are pleased to present Nancy Ornelis as one of our November 2021 Students of the Month. Nancy is one of our unique individuals who bravely takes on challenges and perseveres. Coming from a quiet Spanish-speaking family, a very small elementary school to rock, and the challenges of distance learning, her original experience at Bellama Junior High was overwhelming. This year, Nancy has really stepped it up and is feeling more confident and is nearly earning all A's. Her goals are simply to improve, to expand her learning and to be more creative, and she meets those goals nearly every day. Academically, Nancy has moved into rock star statics, status. Her grades are much better since she is now attending school in person and seems to really be enjoying being part of PJHS. Nancy's art teacher has this to say about her. Nancy is a pleasure to have in class. She is a hardworking, polite, she is hardworking, polite, and gets along with others and always tries her best. Her math teacher adds, Nancy, ha Nancy has a great worth ethic, ethic and, is, and her work is constantly finished and organized. She is ready to contribute to the class discussions, even when randomly selected. Nancy works well with other students in her group and is always polite and helpful in class. Although her shy nat nature and the pandemic has kept Nandy Nancy from participating in many school activities, she enjoys quiet projects with her family. She likes to be creative in the, and takes pleasure in the maker space in the school library with the squishy ball project being one of her favorites. Nancy also enjoys participating in the West Side Relays prior to the pandemic and, in, and is considering being part of the PJs as track and field sports team in the spring. Her family adds, we are so proud of Nancy. Nancy has been selected for a suit in the month. We see that her grades have greatly improved with the encouragement of her teachers and are grateful for the support we have, she has received. Nancy works hard and deserves this recommendation. Congratulations, Nancy. We are fortunate to have Nancy Ornelis as Peluma Junior High and are ple and pleased to present this caring and hardworking young woman to be to the board as student of the month of November, 2021. All right, congratulations, Deshaun and Nancy. And Deshaun, thank you for bringing the basketball team to cheer everyone on. <laughs> All right, hope you guys have a good season. All right, we're gonna move on to the next school. All right. All right. Uh, 
Hello, everyone. I am Nicoletta, and I am pleased to be presenting Petaluma High School's November Student of the Month. Our first student of the month is Elia McFarland. Elia, who is now a senior at Petaluma High School, has gotten involved in the school in many ways. She has showed her school spirit on the cheerleading team freshman year. She has participated in HOSA, and she has taken many honors in AP classes. Elia has particularly enjoyed her math, science, and social science classes at PHS. She's very grateful for the kind friends she has made at PHS and the opportunities that the school has provided for her. In her spare time, Elia likes to go hiking, go to the movie theater, and spend her time with her friends. She has a few hobbies such as knitting and gardening, and her absolute favorite food is oatmeal. Elia hopes to be a nurse one day and move to Scotland. Elia would like to thank all of her teachers and give a huge thank you to Mr. Dosery, Miss Redfield, Miss Ian, Mr. Brazil, and of course, her amazing counselor, Miss Emmanuel. <laughs> the next student of the month for Petaluma High School is Harry Vandermeer. Harry is an avid music connoisseur as he tries to be involved with it as much as he can. He is the PHS band president, drumline captain, a PJHS band volunteer, leads the PHS jazz combo, and likes to perform with some other bands in his free time. Some of his other hobbies include skateboarding, cooking, falling into a rabbit hole on YouTube, the usual for him, and Harry greatly has greatly enjoyed his time at Petaluma High School. He has a, an abundance of loving and caring friends in all of his classes that he wouldn't know what to do without. Although he is still on the fence about life after high school, for the most part, Harry plans to audition for the Blue Devil's Drum in Google Corps, which is a number one nationally ranked corps. If everything goes well, hopefully he can perform one to two seasons with the organization before turning 21. After his time has expired there, he plans to study music or production and composition at the Berkeley School of Music. Harry would like to add that he is very grateful for all of his teachers for nominating him for student of the month. He understands that at times he cannot be the most focused student and says that it is an honor to not necessarily be recognized academically, but through a connection between teacher and student. And for that, he says, thank you. All right, congratulations, Elia and Harry, somewhere out there. Thank you. Great job reading as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, good luck to you the rest of your senior year. All right, are we ready for CASA? Mary Collins. Oh, Mary Collins, okay. up next. Hi, I'm Lily Manns, and I'm happy to introduce our student of the semester, Chloe Hartman. Even though Chloe Hartman has only been a student of the semester at Mary Collins School since the middle of fourth grade, she has risen straight to the top of people who are loved and admired by staff and students. As Ms. Bailey put it, Chloe is a rare student who combines intrinsic compassion and empathy with a natural capacity for risk-taking and leadership. Her voice is curious, inclusive, and filled with passion. She is that student which teachers' dreams are made of. Everyone who has a good fortune of having Chloe in their life knows that she cares about people with a passion. Around the beginning of quarantine, Chloe decided that she needed to find a way to give back to her community and began volunteering with Una Vida. With the aid of Lynn Motique, this allowed Chloe to join a community of like-minded people who are interested in making a difference. Chloe has continued her work with Una Vida and has also been inspired to start Ama Para Todas at group at our school. As you can see, she has the drive and confidence to actually work and make things better. Chloe is also a student who is appreciated for her humble and upbeat attitude. She is always eager to jump into new learning, tackle new challenges, and to keep a smile on her face as she works through things. Ms. Boaz says Chloe models throughout the class work in class and on homework. Her dedication to learning is admirable. She enjoys challenges and asks questions. While Mr. Watt adds, Chloe is a diligent student that is respectful of both teachers and fellow students and also has a great heart and passion for supporting our community and social issues. Chloe's friendships blur all the typical boundaries and lines of middle school social scene because she is such a joy to be with. <laughs> 
Chloe is still weighing her options on where she will attend high school, but she is sure to make a huge impression and continue spreading acceptance, positivity, and change for the better wherever they are lucky to have her. Congratulations, Chloe, on being selected as our Mary Collins School student of the semester. Um, hi, I'm Chloe, also Cherry Valley. I'm excited to present Griffin Doty as our school of this as our student of the semester from Mary Collins School. Griffin has attended our school since kindergarten, but became comfortable with our campus even earlier as a younger brother. As a result, he has absorbed the principles of our school philosophy into his whole learning style. Teachers note that the work they receive from Griffin is always unique and surprising. He approaches learning the way he approaches most aspects of his life with a personal perspective and style that is unlike anything anyone else would do. Teachers regularly have to rethink how to score assignments because of Griffin's outside of the box work. However, this enviable creativity and talent serve him well as a learner. No one who is asked about Griffin's qualities can keep themselves from mentioning his artistic prowess. Mr. Adell says he has his own creative artistic style, which is extremely aggressive expressive and full of energy. Ms. Pellet Coffer agrees by saying he is a gifted artist whose drawing skills and imag imagination knows no bounds. Griffin's mom, Brenda, describes him as a kind, extremely creative and grounded. He loves creating all types of art and learning new skills from teaching himself how to play the guitar to exploring digital design. Griffin is also seen as a person who, though quiet and unassuming, is a person who gets along with everyone. He is someone who who all know they can trust and be treated gently and with respect. Ms. Boaz describes him as a helpful and well-liked by his peers. While Ms. Pelkoffer reflects back to fourth and fifth grade to mention, Griffin is a thoughtful and caring student who I could sit next to any student and I would know Griffin would be a kind influence. He, while, while he has not decided for, which, for sure which high school he will attend, Griffin says it is likely going to be Credo. Wherever he chooses to go, those who know him know that he will continue inspiring everyone with his artwork, challenging his teachers by doing things in a way they have never seen, and continuing to expand his community of friends with his thoughtful, caring ways. We are proud to have Griffin represent Mary Collins School as a student of the semester. All right, congratulations, Chloe and Griffin. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Liza. Chasa? Well, um, yeah, let's do them in December. Um, I think it's okay. Let's do it in December. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, we have the Cool City Challenge. So we're gonna, we're gonna invite Natasha up and Delinda. Oh, here I am. Good evening, everyone. Is there an introduction or am I running straight into this, Matthew? So yeah, just want, want thank you. Um, want to introduce um, Dylan Fisher, and we have also Natasha Juliana, who is here to, to do a, a, a brief presentation about the Cool City Challenge and, and speak a little bit about how Petaluma City Schools can be um, an engaged partner in this, in this challenge. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and thank you for having us here and inviting us. Um, I'm, I'm glad to finally be before you uh, and embarrassed that I haven't been here before. 
Um, the Sil Cool City Challenge was a grant opportunity that started this summer. It was being offered to any city in California that had a population of over 40,000 people and had a climate neutrality goal by 2030. And so we jumped on that opportunity because we have both of those things. Um, the, the application consisted of um, a finding 25 community partners, which included both the public sector and the private sector and the civic sector. And those community partners then helped us find eight cool block leaders each to get us to the 200 we needed for our application. The other half of the application was finding, uh, establishing these moonshot teams and creating policy, finance, community engagement, and technology, and, and looking at those sectors and saying, how can we get to carbon neutrality by 2030? And what are our sort of moonshot ideas and how we're going to get our city to that direction? Um, so we are recently awarded that grant along with two other cities in California, including Irvine and Los Angeles. Recently had a three-day training with those two other cities. So working in collaboration with them. So we really know how to get to our climate goals. Um, um, next year, the grant will be offered to 25 California cities and 25 cities throughout the nation. So we're really leading um, the charge on this. And we ended up now with 300 cool block leaders, so more than the application. And we are in the process of actually finding more. So I'm going to turn it over to Natasha, and she's going to tell you about how we need you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Natasha Juliana. I am the co-chair along with Belinda of the steering committee, and I am the soon to be uh, campaign director. I also am the parent of a now senior at Petaluma High School, and we have gone all the way through the Petaluma City School System. So very thankful for that. Um, so like Delinda said, we will literally be setting the example for the state, the country, and the world. So this is a very exciting opportunity for us to um, involve the whole community in this process and see what we can create. Um, and the goals of this program are very much in line with the Petaluma City Schools recent resolution calling for commitment to climate action, as well as the overarching goals of community, community building and environmental sustainability. So how can the schools participate and amplify this exciting program? Well, we can co-create many future endeavors, but most immediately we invite each school to become a community partner. And our community partners, as Delinda mentioned, help us to find more cool block leaders who will lead their blocks, their literal city blocks, or if you live in an apartment building, your building, through a four and a half month long program in 2022. So this all starts next year. And so just to give you a very quick preview of what that entails, these cool block programs consist of five topics. One is disaster resiliency, which is very much in all of our minds with all of the fires and floods that we've been dealing with. The second is carbon reduction, also um, on most of our minds now, especially with the um, recent reports on the current state of climate change. And number three is water stewardship, also very on point with the drought that we have been in. Uh, very thankful for the rain today. And uh, the fourth one is neighborhood livability, also something we have probably had more experience with over the last few years with the pandemic and spending more time at home. So heightened awareness of what we could do in our neighborhoods there. And then the, the fifth one is empowering others. So how do we bring more people into this conversation and make sure that everyone feels included? So Mary Collins School at Cherry Valley, Live Oak, McNear, and McKinley Schools have already participated by hosting Cool Block Leader information sessions. And so our goal is to engage with every school community in Petaluma. This help us, helps us to reach a broader community of Petaluma residents and make sure that as many people as possible have access to this community building and action oriented program. So we do have three upcoming information sessions, uh, including one next Tuesday, November 16th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And we are happy to schedule an information session for any school or organization that is interested and would like to have a specific time slot for their members. 
Um, please check out our brand new website at coolpetaluma.org and contact us at info at coolpetaluma.org if you want more information or to schedule a, um, a specific information session for your group. We are very excited to be working with the schools and, and have found great relationships. I know as a parent, I am particularly invested in the future and it feels very good to have actions, uh, tangible actions that we can be taking to ensure a safer future for our children. And I think, uh, Matthew, did you say we were going to take questions if there were any? That would be great if you guys can, if you can stick on for a little bit, if the, if the, if our board members have any questions. I guess this is a question for you, Matthew. Can we hook them up with all of our site leadership so that they can directly communicate with them and recruit uh, that way? I think that I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and I had the pleasure of meeting with Natasha and Delinda um, last late late last week, early yeah, yesterday, <laughs> maybe yesterday. Um, yes, yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in a fog, as you can see. Those early mornings. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea, Sheldon. We can certainly hook them up with our leadership team, and 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 I, you know, we spoke when we spoke yesterday. I talked a little bit about you know giving some information out to as well in our in our newsletter to encourage families and school sites to get to get involved. I also wanted to ask. Um, I know that the county, the uh, I'm going to mess up the acronyms here, but I think it's the Regional Climate Action Committee, something like that. Uh, the counties. Uh, there, they have launched uh, a household level climate action. I think they call it Sonoma Climate Challenge. Is this uh, effort coordinated with that, or are you aware with of their efforts too? Because it sounds like there's a there's going to be a lot of overlap. So you're speaking of the Regional Climate Protection Agency, where I am the director for, for you from Petaluma. And um, that was a challenge that they offered about three years ago. And they did that in conjunction with Daily Acts. And it's similar in that um, similar actions that you can take. But the difference between that and this is that people were just taking actions from their home, from their computer, basically. And this is a way to really empower uh, blocks and people to gather. So people will be gathering to five to eight people on a block. And it's really a way of establishing relationships and connections. Um, so you have that accountability to others. So at every meeting, you go through the actions that are possible and choose three or four of the, say, 15 or 20 that are offered. And then you're accountable to your neighbors at the next meeting to say, yes, I did that action and I took that action. And also then that data is going to be available to all of us and the city so that we can track what actions are being taken, not right back to the person, but we can say, this is how much carbon we're saving. This is how much water we're saving. These are the other sorts of things that we're doing in the community. Um, so beyond um, like recruiting families and leaders for the cool block, what other ways do you see yourself partnering with the school district with our families? Uh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, we've been brainstorming and we did talk with Matthew a little bit about that yesterday. Um, the simplest uh, answer would be to um, work with the older kids um, as volunteers. So that would be like a, an easy next step because I know that all, you know, this, the kids have uh, volunteer hour requirements. And so this would be a great way to get them engaged and in on the ground helping with the program, uh, the cool block level and maybe other levels of it as well. Um, and then the, the next step too would be to start to create ways that I know that um, Liza Eichert has been interested when we talked, that's the school that my daughter went to. So I know her well. Um, she's been, in, you know, other schools have been interested in ways that the schools themselves can participate, be that with an after school program for their kids or starting to integrate into curriculum and on campus programs to help with water conservation and carbon sequestration and, and even emergency preparedness on, on school campuses as well. So that is something um, the founder of this program did do a cool school program many years ago. So we are kind of looking back at 
at what that was and how we might start to integrate that. And we definitely want to set an example of, of um, real engagement with the school system so that the cities that come after us have a good template. So we need to work on that with you all to see like what works best um, and, and what makes more se most sense. And, and I would love, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the cool school program. I know it sounds like that was something that happened a while ago. Yeah. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what, what was, what was successful. Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah, that particular program uh, was based around kids like age, um, like fourth, fifth graders, um, and had a similar format where the kids would have sort of action items that they would take on campus um, and at home. And so it followed a similar format to the Cool Block program. I think a lot of the success of these programs is around the community building aspect, not doing things in isolation, but doing them as a group, um, you know, similar to the way you see other programs be successful. Uh, so yes, we could definitely look at that and then, and, and look at it in more detail and see which um, I have the old cool school book. I have a copy of it. So I'm happy to share that and, and we could definitely get into more details in the future for sure. Thank you. Is there an opportunity here also to help us uh, to partner not only with uh, the school sites and, and then the, the family households that are part of them, but also at the district level, at the organizational level? We've set one of our uh, district goals is for long term sustainability of the organization. And, and that not only means financial, but also environmental sustainability with carbon emissions and those kind of things. We are, you know, in the process of electrifying our fleet. We we are looking into microgrids for our, our site, our school sites. Uh, but there's a lot of other opportunities with food services and, and regular operations of the district. Are these are there's there is there opportunity there for a partnership as well, especially with the city? I would say yes. I well, I, I like to say yes to everything. You know, that's kind of been my motto is like we, there's been so much great energy in the community that I, we just really want to get, you know, harness that energy and enthusiasm and get everybody plugged in in whatever way. We do have, like Linda mentioned, these um, moonshot design strategy teams that are going to be looking at larger scale initiatives. And food is certainly on those lists. Um, Delinda might speak more to how, how that could be involved. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to say, um, you know, we should be partnering as a city, right? And the city is one of our partners. Um, and I don't know whether one of you wants to come on our, our core team. Um, and maybe that's a way to get you all plugged in and involved with us. Um, so bring your ideas on a weekly basis to our meetings. Um, and in terms of the food piece, um, yeah, uh, um, I'm on the, on the Sonoma County Food System Alliance and um, and I, I haven't figured out how to tackle that one, but um, there are people in the community that, that have. So I'm gonna suggest that the more we all can partner with each other and not do these things in isolation, you know, and have us help you in any way that we can. I don't know what that looks like, but like Natasha, I'll say yes. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the other super exciting thing that we've just been so energized by is the fact that LA and Irvine are now our partners and are part of our brain trust. So we just, I feel like we have all these new great partners all trying to get to the same goal. And this is no longer a competition. This is all about collaboration and cooperation because we only win when the whole world wins in, in this uh, you know, when it comes to climate change. So it's going to be super exciting to see what kind of ideas we can come up with and then how we can um, collaborate with these other cities to see what they're working on too. So we can learn from each other. So since you like to say yes, uh, I have, <laughs> I'm going to ask you for a favor here. If you have this resource, you know, one of the things that we we're able to, uh, you know, especially with Chris's leadership, we're able to identify opportunities to lower our carbon emissions and those kind of things. But I don't think we have the capacity to strategize, to prioritize those things. And one of the one of the reasons is we don't have the the bandwidth for uh, a carbon audit. Is that something that uh, you all can help us with in term, you know, doing some kind of carbon audit of our of our operations and sites and those kind of things? 
Yes, I, I'm <laughs> <Yes>. seeing your. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for Delinda, but no, I, you know, and 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 honestly, we've been amassing this amazing, like I said, brain trust, and all of these people are coming out to volunteer, and so many people are not wanting to even wait till January when the pro, you know, the block program is officially started. So I, I am confident that we can find people that can help with this if it's you know not the two of us necessarily, but we will. You know, if the, this is a priority of the school system, yes, we are we are excited to help. Yes, it's a priority of the school system. Yeah. So who who do I contact? <laughs> and since you're still saying yes, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm writing my list. Okay. First of all, welcome, Delinda. Cannot Thank believe you. your first meeting. Thank you for attending. You too, Natasha. Anyway, um, so a lot. I mean, traffic safety obviously is near and dear to my heart. Um, and we have had, um, we've seen uh, council member Barnacle put out surveys and people talk about, um, you know, just overall how unsafe streets are, especially around schools. And we've been doing safe routes to schools for years. Um, and I know some of your goals with the cool city is livability right and obviously climate and so i mean that's just a way to solve two issues right there is make it so that our streets are more walkable so i'm just going to throw that out there it's just another um, priority as well safety around but, our schools so i'm going to suggest that so natasha and i have held numerous numerous information sessions um because although we had our community partners we actually held the session for them for their communities and i gotta tell you that Every single time we started that meeting, we said, okay, what do you want to see on your block? And every single person said, I want slower traffic. I want less cars on the street. I want more room for cyclists and, and pedestrians. And so what we're really hoping is that with this, these 300 cool blocks, and eventually we'll have 400 and 500. And with your help, maybe we can get to the entire city, right? But the more we have, as we empower these blocks, to then become districts, right? Everyone, we, we expect that people are now going to come before the city council and say, I want my safe route to school. I want a way to get my child to that school on their bicycle safely. And so it's really a way of empowering our community so that we're not just doing top down or things like safe routes to school, which we've again been doing for years, as you said, you know, are they working? I ride my bike around. I don't feel safe. So you know, I, there's, a, there's a lot that needs to be done. And, and I think by empowering our citizens and our communities that um, we can get more done. Yes, 100%. We're very excited about that. Walkability, bikeability, um, more street trees, all kinds of, you know, more alternative ways to get to school and to work um, are very high on our priority list, very high. We're really trying to solve all the problems with this program at once, yeah. <laughs> but they're all, sounds they're like. also I'm interconnected. Real. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just I just uh, have a, a nitpicky kind of thing, um, and uh, not that I ever do that, um, but uh, we have a school that's that's outside of the city. It's Pengrove, and so I just wasn't sure uh, in terms of. Um, the way that the grant works does it have to be within the city limits in order for the million dollars to be applied or does it matter is it you know we have a lot of students there we have 500 students there so so we have just like a question yeah, we, we, we've we been um, we've been soliciting cool block leaders from even within outside of our city boundaries, as long as you're within the city of Petaluma, not going quite as far as Pengrove. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't go ahead and include it. it there's, it's not precluded in our grant. Um, and the first two years of the grant is actually for staffing so that we can actually staff these cool blocks um, so that everyone feels supported and gets the training and the support that they need to be successful on that level. So um, the other half of the, the other half a million dollars will be in the out years. Um, and we don't know what that funding actually will be used for because we don't know yet what will our, our needs will be. Again, we don't know how to get to climate neutrality by 2030. So we are, you know, we're, we're building the plane as we fly it. Um, but we do have people in Pengrove that are interested. Um, 
I, I don't know. Like Natasha, she's going to say yes. So, well, <laughs> I don't know what, that means. what we had been saying was as long as your address says Petaluma on it, because we do have, a, I myself live on Gossage Avenue, which is just like, I mean, the city limit goes like right around me. So, um, we were including people in rural Petaluma. We have technically turned away people from Pengrove as much as I hate to do that, but we have also sort of argued that we are the smallest city that has been included in this process. So, you know, maybe our arms can reach a little further and just call it a neighborhood. And, and it is a good point, you know, the Pengrove school. Um, it is, yeah, the school is, is a part of Petaluma. Part of our district. Yeah. Right. So yeah. You could argue that and. Exactly. <laughs> that, yeah, makes, that, that makes perfect sense to us. me. Yeah, I don't think so we need thank to argue. you for coming and including us on this. You know, one of the things um, that I know that we we're all interested in is working with the city more. Um, so because um, we all, as you said, are in the same community and we're all dealing with the same issues and the same people. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I don't know how to how to work with you more, but let's figure out how to do yeah. that. We, <laughs> we do have a new staff member in our city manager's office who is dedicated to climate. So maybe she can have a meeting with Matthew and maybe we can start to figure these things out. Wow. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, Thank you. Time. Nice to see you, even if it's on Zoom. All right. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you for having us. Thank, Thank you. Both you. For coming. So at this point, um, I think we can... Our CASA, our CASA students are back oh. on and ready, ready oh, okay. to go. If we okay. can go back to that item and then we'll then we'll move forward. All right. Hey, Dan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience and flexibility here. I believe we still have everybody here. Hi, Tori. Good to see you. Welcome. And Edward is here as well. Fantastic. Good evening, Edward. All right. Our November Students of the Month for Casa Rana High School. Edward Serafimescu. Edward has a deep passion for learning and always enjoyed him challenging himself academically. Mathematics is his favorite subject and in addition, the most to taking the most advanced classes at Casa Grande. He is currently pursuing Calculus 3 at Santa Rosa Junior College. He also enjoys offering math tutoring to his classmates and leading the school's academic decathlon team and computer science club. Being involved in the community has a special meaning for him. As a first generation American, he understands the importance of stepping up and helping others. Teaching science, to elementary school students for five years and preparing them for Science Olympiad and volunteering his free time at Redwood Food Bank, packaging food for people in need are a few examples of his dedication. He's also an avid hiker and loves Sonoma County parks and beaches that he frequently cleans as part of his personal commitment to protect the environment. He's looking forward to college to broaden his knowledge, hoping to solve some of the, some of the stringent problems in our society. Congratulations, Edward. All right, and Tori Kane. Tori is a hardworking student who is a senior at CASA. Tori has been involved in the basketball program at CASA for all four years, three of the years playing on varsity. Because of his interest in the basketball program, he founded and served as the president of the basketball club this year. Tori also played lacrosse freshman and sophomore year and plans to return this year in the spring. Fantastic. His plans after high school are to attend a four-year college in California to pursue a degree in civil engineering. His top schools that he hopes to attend are UCLA, UC Berkeley, or Cal Poly. Tori's favorite teacher at CASA was his sophomore honors chemistry teacher, Mr. Creighton, who challenged him while also making the class fun and very enjoyable. In his spare time, Tori works at Batteries Plus Bulbs, and some of his hobbies include bowling with his friends, snowboarding, and going to the gym. Congratulations, Tori.
Thank you, Dan, for reading. Thank you, Tori and Edward, for sticking around. Congratulations. Very proud of you both. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations again. Okay, now looks like it's Chris Thomas with the facilities update. I'm looking at our uh, producer over here trying to make sure that I'm doing it correctly. <laughs> okay, so tonight we are coming to you with a brief facilities update. Um, and and I'm going to go through a slide for most of our schools, a slide for the ones that we're doing the most amount of work at. Um, I'm going to comment on some of the stuff that we completed over the past several months, and then just kind of give you a, a, a a, a preview by school of some of the stuff we're gearing up for for summer 22 summer 23 so go ahead ashley so at pengrove elementary school um as you probably know we reconfigured the parking lot we got that completed this past summer very challenging with our year-round schools to get stuff done in a six-week period of time um, we also installed at that time, same project, a new AD Accessible or Americans with Disabilities Act accessible ramp from the basement up to the office. A lot of concrete was poured, let's just say that. If you haven't had a chance to go see that ramp in an earthquake, go stand on the ramp because that ramp's not going anywhere. <laughs> um, student restroom repairs as part of that project, DSA or the Division of State Architect required that we also look at a couple of restrooms um, there are boys and girls restrooms in the multi that literally within a half an inch were not accessible so we had to reconfigure those move the toilet slightly move the partitions at the same time what we did is we came in and fixed the boys restroom across from the multi that actually had some sewer line some broken sewer lines so the urinals were not functional so we came in removed the bad urinals we did the sewer line, put in new urinals. So we got all of that done over their fall break. Um, so that's super exciting bathroom repairs. <laughs> um, what we're gearing up for to really begin summer of 22 is to look at a four classroom building at the back of the campus, replacing it with a six classroom building and also adding a library building. So as you're probably aware, we've added, we're at 19 classrooms at Pine Grove now. We've added three classrooms since I've been here. So we converted the former YMCA building into a classroom. That was a YMCA building constructed by the district for YMCA, but we recaptured that, moved YMCA into the basement of the admin building after doing some renovations um, and turned it into a classroom. Then the following summer, we took the computer lab moved a wall in the library to make the computer lab big enough to serve as a classroom we put a classroom in the computer lab and then a year and a half ago just before the pandemic hit we converted the library into a classroom and took away their library so currently the library is kind of operating on the stage we've had a lot of um, growth at that campus and we anticipate there may be continued growth so in order to take some of the pressure off and to be able to allow them to matriculate kids because right now we have three classrooms per grade level but when we get into that fourth fifth and sixth we hit a pinch point we actually have to restrict how many students they put tk through third grade so that they can actually matriculate them when they get to the upper grade levels the solution for this, because it's a fairly landlocked school, um, there's not a lot of space to expand, is to demolish a four classroom modular building, not portable, modular, so it's modular in design, kind of like a portable, that's at the very back of the campus adjacent to the field. Demolish that and in its place construct a six classroom building. And then kind of adjacent or behind, if you will, on the blacktop near the multi, construct a library. So we've been having some design conversations with um, the site staff, teachers, the principal staff, um, talking about what that design would look like. That's moving forward very quickly. Um, and we're hoping to actually start that construction next summer. 
now the challenge is going to be in order to demolish a four classroom building we have to put those kids and those teachers somewhere right so that means we're going to have to put portables on the blacktop which is going to be super inconvenient for a period of time and the challenge will be getting all the site work done putting the four portables in in time to move the teachers in and hold school and then we can demolish the classroom building so we had that conversation we started to have it a couple of days ago when i met with that site team so a lot of work is has happened at pengrove it's going to continue to happen super exciting because i really think this is going to improve the school site tremendously one thing i didn't put here either is one of the other projects that we're contemplating is um is putting a restoring, repairing, replacing, whatever you want to say there um, in the kinder, one of the kinder classrooms, there were two tiny restrooms that the sewer lines are completely gone. So they actually, before I got here, they had them filled in with concrete, the sewer lines themselves. So they kind of turned them into storage. So what we'd like to do is, re is, is take those two restrooms out, replace it with one kinder restroom that's you know gender neutral, and then um, and get the sewer lines functioning so that classroom can actually function better as a kinder. So those, that's an example of projects that are you know, kind of in process, if you will. Okay, I'm sorry, Pengra was probably the most complicated school, so we won't spend quite as much time on each slide. Going to the next slide, Mary Collins at Cherry Valley. Some of you were commenting early, we did some exterior paint, really transformative. That campus is just gorgeous now. Um, we did interior improvements to the child care portable building so North Bay Children's Center moved out champions was moving in We worked with the city on licensing. And we renovated very quickly the interior of those two buildings primarily using our in house support staff our maintenance guys. Um, turned out absolutely stunning the guys did a great job we had a flooring company come in and put new flooring so um, I know the the parents and the students were super excited about that. We also did some site work improvement in front of the school. There's a lot of accessibility issues on that campus, a lot of wonky pavement. Mm -hmm. If you go out there, you know, you've got the big track and field that we redid, the play area, the play structure where the solar panels are. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this blacktop that slopes at a pretty significant slope mm -hmm. until it gets closer to the buildings and then it really drops off and slopes way down. So. We're working with QKA architects to give us a proposal to actually re envision that blacktop, get in some ADA accessible paths of travel, put in some seat walls, some retaining walls, and actually flatten out that play area, make it more, a more effective play area. So that's one of the projects that we're kind of going into design on. And then we're working on new exterior signage. And so as we're painting the schools, most of our schools did not have ADA accessible signage yeah. with Braille. They just didn't. I, I was shocked never seen a school they most of our signage was stenciled cherry valley actually had wooden signs made so we took all of those down we put up some temporary signs and we're um working with the sign company to redo all of the exterior signs except for the main one up front which is still beautiful um so that we actually have accessible signage we're also doing that with mckinley we're in process we've already done that with federal high school and Pedlam and Junior High is in production. So we'll talk about that in a minute. McDowell, um, we planted some trees in the kinder yard and the grassy area. We worked with the school site to do that. We're kind of hamstrung right now because of the drought. So I'd like to be planting more trees, but that's a little bit challenging when you're in a drought. We're also working with the committee on doing exterior paint, summer of 22. They really want to re-envision, they the school site want to re-envision the paint colors much like we did at Cherry Valley. So that process is underway. And then we're also looking at um, renovation of the multi-purpose building um, at McDowell. It's in desperate need. I would say Cherry Valley is too, but that's probably summer of 23. Right now, next summer, we're hoping to focus on McDowell and McNair. McKinley, um, we've done some HVAC replacement that we're working on. Um, this kind of goes to the, the net neutrality or the reducing our carbon footprint. We actually did have energy audits done just for you to know under Prop 39. And so we're looking at one of our biggest carbon impacts is really from our HVAC units because we have many that are circa two, 19, 1990s, early 2000s that are really in desperate need of replacement. 
So you'll see that kind of a lot of that's going hand in hand with the roofing project. We're looking at new play structure. McKinley's play structure. Matthew's shaking his head because he and I started having these conversations five years ago when I first got here. Um, so working with Ani Larson to really how do we redo those play structures? And again, renovating their multi. Another issue for McKinley is that they're also growing. So they're another one of our school campuses that's growing. There's a um, Sonoma County Office of Education had put a building on the corner near the Kinder Play Yard that functions as our preschool run by South County now. So we've been working with a site committee at McKinley and South County to remove that building and to put in three, well, two TK Kinder classrooms and one new South County designed as a special education classroom and then redoing the blacktop play area, which will actually allow them to have better facilities for their their kinder TK. Right now they've got a kinder class. Is it down like by the second grade for a second grade? Exactly. Like they have to walk quite a ways just to get to the kinder play yard. So that's in design. We're hoping to start construction summer of 22 as well. And then Grant Elementary, we did some window replacement. Um, there was a bunch of windows, excuse me, that had plexiglass. I don't know why there was this huge focus X number of years ago, well before my time where they replaced windows with plexiglass bad idea they scratch they discolor they you know they, they get whatever so we did do that it's not on here but one of the other projects we need to contemplate for grant is really um thinking about the surface of the track we removed the rubber surface there's base rock there it's not a perfect solution so we'll probably have to be contemplating that mcnear elementary we did a bunch of carpet replacement second phase so they have all new floor covering at that school, which is great. Um, we did a whole bunch of work in the kinder play area. There was a bunch of cracking and stuff in the play, in the blacktop. We repaired all the cracks, restriped, slurry sealed, and expanded it. We gave them a whole little area next to the building that's concrete and a seat wall. And then um, we're also looking at HVAC units for um, McNair as well. And then again, the renovation to their multi. Their multi is much more complicated than like the Valley Vista because their restrooms are not AD accessible. They're very small. So we're actually going to have to push the wall out because the kitchen's also small. So there's like restroom, kitchen, restroom. We're going to have to figure out how to make those restrooms accessible, which means it's a more complicated design solution. But that's one of the things we're looking at probably summer of 23. Valley Vista got a new phone system this past um, this past summer. We did again window replacement. We replaced many of their really bad windows with new aluminum windows. They got asphalt, re new asphalt in the upper and the lower. We we replaced the child care building. A lot of work on that campus. That campus actually looks great, and their floor coverings in really good shape. So we don't have to worry about that. Going on to our junior highs, Kenilworth. Um, so the existing solar system that was put in back in 2004-05 under a power purchase agreement or a PPA was a technology that at the time was probably considered cutting edge. Unfortunately, it became more like bleeding edge because it didn't end up being a very good technology. And unfortunately, it's actually damaging our metal roofs. So the um, vendor Greenbacker who owns the power purchase agreement is responsible to actually remove components of that existing one and then their insurer is paying to have our roofs redone. So that <clears throat> we're working with them for summer of 22 to do that work, at least the roof, the removal and the roof repair. And then we'll have to start having a conversation about what do we do with the solar because it's going to need a whole new solar system, a whole new solar PV system. Do we pay for it through the bond? Do we do another PPA agreement? Those are all conversations probably later this winter, spring, we'll start having. Okay. Yeah, that, that you know, it, the solar system is, you know, if it was put in, the school was built in about 2003. The solar system came a year or two after that. So say 2005 for easy math, that's 16 years. So 16 years on a solar system, it's kind of pushing it's useful life, especially that older technology. So it's probably about time we rethink it anyway. But to, to answer your question, 
there's a lot going on at Kenilworth in large part because of the design. Right. Again, I really think that the vision was very cutting edge at the time. Things like cooling towers don't work in this environment. So as you can see, replace HVAC is throughout this slide because we've replaced the C wing, which is the music band leadership room area. We've done locker room. We did, now did three more buildings. We did J, G, and the wood shop. And now we're looking at doing H and F next summer, which are the last classroom buildings, not including the portables. That will be summer of 22. And then at that point, almost all of it will have new HVAC systems that specifically, we're basically abandoning the boiler, radiant floor, radiant flooring heat, and doing all HVAC. We'll have to be looking at the multi and the office library later to, to assess those, okay? Edelman Junior High School, a lot of painting here, um, a lot of portable repairs down on the blacktop. Uh, the paint project came out beautiful. We also restriped, slurry sealed, redid the blacktop. Um, we have removed a lot of dead trees. I would say this is across our, our district. I never thought in my career I would be taking out so many trees. But the, the extreme drought, the impacts of the extreme drought over a long period of time, there was a former drought, now this one, it's really, the, especially our redwood trees have not, have not fared well. And then here we have, again, to the carbon footprint, we're looking at our battery backup project and completely switching out the main switch gear. So the update on this, unfortunately, we're hitting up against the procurement challenges that we're hearing about in the news. Right now, we were hoping to do the main switch gear at Pebble Junior High over winter break. Current information is we're not gonna get the equipment for the main switch gear until August 2nd or 3rd. And we basically said, no, we're not, change, we're not gonna switch out switch gear just before school starts. So. This is a kind of we're working that problem to actually identify when are we going to get the main switch gear. We can't do the battery until we change the switch gear. So this this project is is moving forward. We're we're actively we meet every week to talk about it, but we are having some procurement issues, which is not totally surprising. And then again, we're working on that new exterior signage. That's actually in production right now. Okay, Casa Grande. So as you know, we spent a lot of time out there this summer replacing all of the underground gas um, lines. Those, those are amazing gas lines, so we shouldn't have any issues until well after I've retired, <laughs> maybe permanently retired. Um, new, new regulators, new valves. We actually installed an earthquake shutoff, which is by code that was not there before. So in a major earthquake, it automatically shuts off the gas to the entire campus. Four different shutoff valves so we can actually isolate four major quadrants of the campus. If there's a gas leak, and we can isolate the campus. So that was a really good project. We're under progress. Unfortunately, the rain has hit. The plaza construction is underway. Um, one of the things I will share with you is out there on Monday, and we were looking at this project and um, what we're finding is that there are um, both the sewer lines that run through there and the underground storm drain are all transite pipe. Transite is asbestos. Thank you. We're looking at abandoning all of it because, um, again, there was a small, there were some trees in that area and they impacted, the roots were impacting them. We had them hammered. And we don't want to have old pipes under brand new concrete work. We're getting prices right now to replace all of it, the sewer line and the storm drain in that particular area. HVAC and roofing project at the admin and the multi were completed over the summer. We've had some challenges in the rain and identified every possible point of water intrusion. So we're working that problem. And again, we have our battery backup project that's gonna be at, at um, um, CASA. Their main switch gear replacement will not happen. They have a, their switch gears in fine shape. It's not as old as Pedalum and Junior Highs. So it's just really battery backup. 
And then we have an exterior paint committee in process. I have to say, I'm not the biggest fan of the Casa colors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the building colors, I don't mean the spirit colors. So um, we're working um, with QKA again to work with that site committee and so that we can try to find good colors. We haven't quite met with them yet, but that's an underway. So okay. love to paint, repaint Casa. Quick question, do we have um, the regulators in the that to follow the school? Well, all, yeah, every school has regulators, but what we did is we replaced. Okay, we replaced the regulators just as a course of action. But every school site has a regulator for every building, so where the gas goes in, it has a okay. regulator. But what, when we did the underground project, we just we didn't want to attach brand new lines to old regulators, so we replaced all of them. Okay, I was just curious. Thanks. The earthquake shutoff valve. I don't. I don't know the answer to that because again, you do those when you upgrade. Right. Um, I'm sure our newer schools have them. Okay. Okay, next. And I'm almost done. Petaluma High School, exterior signage, all complete. That school's turned out really well. We do, we did put in our new sidewalks at English and Broadway. So part of that project, however, because it did take out two large sycamore in the street, the city did, not us, is to replace it with is to put in numerous trees along that area, which we're prepared to do, and to add vines along the new fence we put in at the tennis courts, but not during a severe drought. Right. <laughs> so we're waiting to kind of see if the if the lifting of the drought restrictions happens, which will probably happen once we know we're actually going to get good water for the remainder of this rainy season. Um, but that is definitely something the neighbors I know are tracking on and we're tracking on it. And we're going to have to plan for the repainting of the, the science wing and the art wing. And then we are also looking at the possibility of doing more roofing on these schools. Our, my main job in facilities has been HVAC and roofing and gas, I would add. So anyway. Last slide, district-wide, what are we looking at? We've got the drought restrictions. I touched on that a little bit. I don't want to understate this. We have done a ton of work, and the city has been a great partner in helping us understand where we've had challenges. Um, you know, we reduced irrigating our fields to only two times a week. Our fields were looking terrible. I noted after all the rain when I got back from vacation that they're, they're greening up again. Thank mm -hmm. goodness the rain hit. Um, we had turned almost completely turned off the irrigation for all of our other planting areas. We have not planted any new trees or other stuff right now. Um, and we're trying to work with some of our partners because some of our partners um, were not as um, faithful in helping support our irrigation reduction efforts. So that continues to be a bit of a challenge. You know we're getting our 15 new electric buses. We've received three of them. We have two more coming anytime. And then we have 12 more coming next um, spring. So that's 15 altogether. So we have a charging station project in which they're going to have to upgrade, they being PG&E, upgrade our electrical service. So P we're working with PG&E. We've got that going. It's underway. It's actually in design with PG&E now. So it's passed a couple of phases so far. And then we're also going to be working, we're working with our designers on the electrical part on our side of the meter. So PG&E has to do new service and a new meter specifically for them. And then we have to take it from the new meter and um, get the, let the, the charging stations in. And we have a grant that's paying for the majority of that. Oh, good. Same grant that paid for the additional 12 buses is paying for the infrastructure. Those and then we have our pre we have a preschool building moving forward at the McDowell corner of Maria and McDowell, so that's super exciting too. And we have grant funding to support the majority of that as well. The only other thing I didn't touch on at Casa was the M wing. M wing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I caught. The M wing. We um, will be bringing a proposal most likely in December from our architects and engineers to um to redesign and to, well to design a replacement system for the m wing for the hvac i i've already had them assessing the system we already have a lengthy report from an electrical and mechanical or mechanical engineer 
the system is old. The, the units themselves are again 1990s, and um, it's very difficult when you take one HVAC unit that's going to support four to six classrooms with an energy management system, Sizerco, that averages the temperature in the classrooms that are on the sunny, hot side of the building, right. but also supporting on the shady, cooler side of the building. It's just the system doesn't work. And that's why our teachers and our staff are frustrated and have been for many years. This is not a new thing. They have a right to be frustrated. But on top of that, that we have an energy management system that was installed that has some odd sensor that if you put your hand against the center, you, you know what I mean, depending on if it's hot or cold. So the teachers have no control over the environment temperature in their classroom. And so unfortunately, the more I've looked at this issue, the more it was clear to me I couldn't just fix it. It was very few things. We actually did some stuff. I had a mechanical company come in and the dampers, which are the things inside the ductwork that control airflow. We're only 10% open, so we moved them to 50% open. Well, it solved some people, made some people like, woohoo. Other people got even colder or hotter, depending. Right. So, what we really need to do is move to a design where each classroom has some sort of unit that controls their airflow, right. heat, cold, ventilation. Um, so, we're working through the different options of how to do that. And trying to find the least impact because like you could put a corner unit in the corner but it takes up space in the classroom so we're um we're evaluating that right now and hoping to bring that to you um for a summer 22 project so i'm sure you've heard plenty about that particular building i just wanted to touch on it um that it's 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 definitely underway okay with that i'll stop talking any questions chris when you talk uh, I think you were talking about Kenilworth when you, you made a passing comment about having to decide whether the funding is going to come from bonds or not. In general, what's our decision making process for deciding you have some big ticket items on the, uh, that you talked about today. What is our process for deciding this is bond funding versus general fund versus some grant or something else? That's a great question. You know, we look at all of our capital facilities funds and we try to make a determine and, and we look at our bond funds and we know we have a project list of what was originally contemplated in the bond. That project list does not require we do every project. But part of the project list is modernization, which is a very broad category. So that's where we can do interior paint, exterior paint, carpet, renovating the multis, et cetera, restrooms. But we don't want to go to the bond funds first because we know that's limited in nature. What we want to do is we also want to look at our other capital facilities, things like collecting developer fees. And we want to say, okay, if we're adding, and, and developer fee money has to be spent based on a nexus to growth. Like you can use it to renovate and modernize if there's a clear nexus. I'm, I'm renovating the YMCA portable or building into a classroom, right? So I can use capital facilities funds to do that. But I can't necessarily just renovate a, a, a multi if there's no growth. So doing things like McKinley and Pengrove and CASA, where we're adding classrooms, and I didn't put that on CASA slide either, we're adding five classrooms at CASA. Um, we look at more restricted funds. So the capital facilities funds developer fees are restricted to growth. We want to tap into those funds first and then use bond funds to augment, because that is in the project list too, portable replacement adding classrooms. So, so that's kind of what we do is we go through and we analyze what kind of capital facilities funds do we have? What's the best use, the most restricted, using that first and then augmenting with other. Yeah, and then, you know, we have our routine restricted maintenance. If we're replacing an HVAC unit on a portable, we did two portables that at Kenilworth, we're going to use maintenance money to do that because really that's a maintenance project. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and the bonds aren't limited to growth. Uh, uh, they don't have to be, we don't have to establish that this is for growth. No, for no. the bond funds are, are they're, um, they're basically, um, they're basically uh, spoken for based on the project list because it's a Prop 39 bond. Okay. 
if it was not a non prop 39 bond it's different but a prop 39 bond you have to do a project list and and you have to kind of follow that list solar was part of that list so we can literally use bond funds for Kenilworth because solar was part of it. We're using that for the battery project because by extension, mm -hmm. the battery is a component mm -hmm. of the solar. Okay. So we always look to the project list that was contemplated when the bonds were authorized by the voters. Right. And we go for that, but it's not limited. For example, because our project list included technology, we used it for a lot of the one-to-one -one devices and other infrastructure. Thank you. I will say, um, while we're on the topic, though, because this is an important point, we will be looking at probably doing the final bond sale later this winter. Wow. Because as we're gearing up for some of these larger projects, we're going to need more liquidity in the bond funds. So we're looking at the final bond sale. And we do, tonight on consent, you'll see we've added another, we're recommending another appointment to the bond oversight. Mm -hmm. We now believe we can have a quorum and we're going to schedule our first meeting okay that we've had in a bit okay okay any other questions thanks chris thank you all right um ed services Ashley Collingwood is also <laughs> sounds so much different. Uh, it's our communications coordinator. Uh, we also um, um, miss Maite. She used to be a part of our department, but we've uh, we've absorbed uh, um, Molly Nagel as our uh, part of our special services under its services. So. Uh, this is just a visual of some of the responsibilities that we directly or indirectly are responsible for. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a big responsibility. However, we, um, we work, our, our work uh, that we do is, is not alone. We work closely with human resources and with student services and very closely with fiscal services. Almost everything that we do requires uh, fiscal oversight or, or guidance or support. Uh, so I probably should just have a, a desk in, in Chris's office because uh, a lot of things that we do really um, rely on fiscal. Um, so we want our work to be deeply rooted in, in equity, and we don't want to just simply level the playing field, but we also want to identify those barriers and break those barriers down. To support that work and to fulfill the board's goals, as you know, we, we are embarking on the district equity study currently underway. Uh, secondary schools are, should be finishing up next week, uh, and the elementary schools will begin uh, December and should finish within a couple of weeks uh, there. So hopefully we'll, we'll get a report sooner than, than I actually anticipated. So we're looking forward to that. Wait to see. Uh, another area of focus for Ed Services is the area of mathematics. And, um, and I'll actually let Josh kind of talk uh, about this. <laughs> there we go. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah, my name's Josh Dice. Um, yeah, so I'm the new district math coordinator. Um, it's fun having a job that's never existed before, um, and I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, and you know, knowing that, and also, and um, grounding our work in the work that you guys have done around your board goals and your mission um, has been really useful. And as you know, that in there is that we you guys want to start with common assessment starting in mathematics so that has been the conversation now it's not all about assessments but that is a very nice vehicle to have the conversations um, and so one of the things that we did as a math committee and is 
took your mission and your work and then okay what does that look like for math and so really uh, i'm going to read it to you real quick um, in pcs we want to build mathematical thinkers who are confident to take risks work creatively and communicate their reasoning while becoming mathematically competent so so that whatever we do whether it's assessments or instruction or what or interventions that they're gain that we're aiming at that um and so we are currently wor working in the arena of assessments but also in other areas and this will allow us to have those conversations around what's important um how do we know that we're m matching those goals and then the most important part of the cycle that has been missing is okay once kids do these assessments or once we do some data collection to have a cycle and a systemic way of looking at that, that information. So that's what we're working on in mathematics right now. Sounds great. Thank you. I love uh, the idea of common assessments. <laughs> Can you go back to that slide for a second? I just want to see. Have you ever gotten any pushback on uh, common assessments, the like in terms of equity? Just wondering. Uh, say more about what you mean by in terms of equity. Um, just because um, I've just heard people in passing say that it could be an equity issue. I don't know why, but I'm just wondering if you've. Um, um, most heard people that. are in um, favor of common assessments in general, and the, the the reticence comes around that last point that we really want to make sure that the teachers and systems are looking at the data that that's the piece been missing piece that lots of work and i was a part of this a decade ago in this district that you know built assessments um and then great we gave them and then what so that's been the pushback and and the reticent is that they didn't have an opportunity to look at the data after they took them and we've already started working on some of that and i would just add that the equity piece when it comes to common assessments is it's all as josh said it, it is all about the work that happens afterwards how do how do teachers meet and, and discuss data and look at it and think about what you know what it what is happening in one classroom and, and it's not a it's not a way to we're not assessing teachers we're assessing how how do we how do we use this to improve um, what we're doing in the classroom that's really what it's about thank you josh um, another area is, is social science. It is also an important area we are focusing on. And one of uh, Lindsay's actual, actual initiatives to support uh, the social sciences. So with that, I'll let her kind of talk about that. Yeah, so the um, history social studies adoption is underway. We have had one meeting so far. During that meeting, K-12 educators from across the district came together. And we started by talking about what do we want um, our kids to experience in history classes? What do we want them to come out of those experiences with? And from that input, we drafted a, um, an instructional vision for um, students' experiences in history classes. That instructional vision is going to be revisited throughout the process. Um, and I think the first place that we'll go back to it is after we spend some time with the framework. So we're really grounding this process in the 2016 framework, which includes content standards. It includes the Common Core literacy standards. It includes all of the requirements that are outlined in the FAIR Act. And it also outlines some instructional shifts that are happening in the state for history, social science education, including taking an inquiry approach to history education, and then also really bringing in um, civic engagement. So those are two pretty major instructional shifts that are outlined in the framework. We will be partnering with some colleagues up at the county office during our next meeting. They're going to help demystify this really, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages, this framework. So they're going to break it down for us, really make it meaningful for teaching and learning, and um, really make sure that the committee has that common anchor from which we can build our work in, in the adoption. During our first meeting in October 2, the committee developed um, a draft of a timeline for this work. We want the work to be really meaningful. Um, and what it's looking like for most grade levels, um, the three meetings we have after we spend some time in the framework, 
uh, we'll be looking at some of the materials, deciding what to pilot, and it's looking like the pilot will probably be spring 22 and or fall 22. And then the board recommendation would come later that winter. Great. This, uh, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I was just wondering um, where, did you talk at all about ethnic studies? Is that, is that come into the history social, social studies curriculum or is it? Yeah, so ethnic studies, the course will need to be developed um, because of the new graduation requirement. Where we're at in the state right now with that, um, AB, the trailer bill AB 130 allocated $50 million towards supporting districts in the development or the expansion of their ethnic studies courses. As of what CDE knew this morning, they don't know when those dollars are gonna be coming okay. out to help us with that. So they think probably sometime this year, but they had really no timeline for that. But it will be within the history social studies. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This sounds like it's going to be a pretty big shift. What type of um, professional development do you envision? Yeah, so I think once the materials are decided on, there's going to be a two track of professional development that goes along with it. One is just the basics. Where do I find this thing in that book for, you know, how, how are the materials organized? And then along with that are really diving into those instructional shifts with the framework. Um, we can you know, partner with the county office. There's a couple of pretty dynamic educators up there um, who I think, I think would be great leading our teachers in this work. And then how do we, I guess, um, like guarantee that these are actually being taught, you know, like the, like the new material? Because I know there's been pushback in other states and other areas, you know, with the diversifying the curriculum and um, with all the things that you've, especially FAIR Act and. Yeah, just, the, yeah go the, ahead. the history social science educators that I've talked with are um, really enthusiastic about this and they're really, they can't wait to get new materials. Oh, good. Um, so I'm, I'm not predicting that that would happen here, but I think we would really need to partner with the site administration, you know, and, and make sure that they're seeing it when they're boots on the ground in the classroom. Great. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And speaking about professional development, um, it's also one of the key areas that we're, we'll, we'll be focusing on as well, especially as we look to, to um, exit out of this uh, uh, pandemic and, and determine, you know, what, what would a post-pandemic classroom kind of look like and, and what will be the trainings and, and professional development needed to, to make sure that we can be successful. So our district, um, as you know, has partnered with Circle Up Education to provide a series of trainings around restorative practices, equity conflict resolutions, for example. Uh, there's been trainings for leadership, uh, identifying practitioners who will work at the school sites and work with their leaderships around restorative practices and restorative justice conflict resolutions as well as various other training topics um, from restorative practices to conscious con conversations to uh, circle design, uh, racism uncovered conscious com um, conversation trainings uh, that are continuously ongoing through this year uh, and I think into next year as well. Um, it is something that was started, I believe, last year uh, with student services, um, but it is something that I think professional development is something we all support and, all, um, and that we all are kind of a part of. In addition to that, um, our department has also done various trainings with our with our site administration, everything from culturally responsive leadership to instruction, best instructional strategies and practices that they can uh, take uh, to their school sites, uh, as well as um, uh, response to intervention. Uh, actually, uh, Josh and Lindsay did a great uh, workshop with our principals around uh, uh, acceleration and remediation and knowing the difference between the two and, and kind of the research around that. Uh, we'll also be doing a series of professional development for our assistant principals. Uh, we feel that they'll, they'll need some support um, and training in areas as we develop them to be principals uh, uh, someday. Uh, the great thing, or all professional development typically uh, isn't free and they come with some costs. So fortunately, we do have funding that will support that. Uh, I think last time I, I might have mentioned that we had an educator effectiveness block grant that will be coming. Uh, and we'll bring, be bringing the plan to, uh, to board sometime in December. But we also have Title II funds that we can use to, to support our professional development. Is that a, a, a state grant or a federal? 
I believe it's a yeah, state grant. It's a $1.5 billion allocation. We're uh, anticipated to receive 1.5 million, about 500,000 for the elementary and a million for the secondary. Yeah, and um, that's a great. The great thing is uh, we have till 2026 to to spend it. So it's not like we have to all spend it in one year. We we have multi multi year um, timeline for that. That's excellent. Um, programs are a big part of Ed Services. Um, so. You know, we want to be responsive to our community and wants and needs, and we are constantly evaluating our programs, looking to see what we can strengthen or build. Uh, and I'll let Esmeralda kind of talk about uh, our program survey. Hi, everyone. So an effort to be responsive to our elementary um, families and our incoming parents, we have opened up a survey that is currently open now through November 15th with the intent to really understand what are the interests and the needs of parents with children zero to five. We have included dual language immersion as a program option, really wanting to solidify and see um, if that continues to be a desired program of choice in addition to other areas such as STEAM, International Baccalaureate. So putting in programs that we currently have running at our sites along with other ones to really help solidify the direction that we take um, in being responsive to our families. These um, surveys were sent out through the school sites um, through district communication and also um, through a marketing company that's helping us expand and looking at the thousands of residents that reside within Petaluma so we can get a nice cross-section of, fam of prospective families as well. So we hope to be analyzing that um, data after November 15th and begin planning and, and looking at future programming at elementary level. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying thanks. <laughs> oh, wait. Before she sits down, anyone have a question for her? No? Okay. It's too late. Um, so one big area of focus for us is actually our career tech education. Uh, this will be a huge piece for all schools across the, all of the United States. Um, and if we do this right, it can be very transformative uh, for our community, for our students we serve, uh, and for our system as a whole. It isn't enough we succeed in getting students to graduate, but we also must ask ourselves, what, what are we preparing the students for? Uh, so our educational success will be deeply tied to our ability to expose and prepare students to industry and, and the education to access the workforce of the future. And why is this important? So California um, will not meet its 2025 workforce if we don't strengthen the pipeline, uh, particularly for students of color. So for example, the class of 2025 in the state of California, of the 100 African-American and Latinx students, 59 and 68 respectively will graduate high school. But of those, eight and nine of them will, will enroll in a four-year college. And of those, only four or five will actually uh, graduate within six years. If we zoom out even further, 25% of students won't graduate. That's one in four. And for students of color, that's sometimes even higher, up to 40%. So those that are dropping out are vastly excluded from the available jobs of today's economy, and they also make a large portion of those incarcerated. Uh, the, the, um, the visual to, you, to the right essentially is saying that four out of 10 ninth graders who will end up going to college, and only one of those um, uh, will be employed in the, in the career of their choice. And, and one, four of them will, will actually receive, uh, reach college, but one of them will be underemployed and one of them will be uh, actually have, uh, uh, will be able to pursue the career of their choice. Uh, so the skills gap is real and it will cost the economy $1.2 trillion. Um, in manufacturing, it will cost about a trillion dollars just because the skill gaps aren't there for, for us to fulfill uh, some of those jobs. So it's a social and economic um, um, issue for us as a, as a nation. So what does this mean for us? It means that we must not want to contribute to the statistics, uh, and we must do better. Um, and we will follow those that are closing the gaps for our, for our students. And if there is no one closing those gaps, then we will lead, because we definitely don't want to contribute to the statistics that we see here. Uh, currently, uh, I know it's probably hard to see, but this is kind of just a visual of a lot of the pathways that we already have at our school sites, from advanced manufacturing, engineering, 
to ag science, health and science and medical uh, technology, arts, media and entertainment, hospitality and tourism, business and transportation are all part of the pathways uh, that we have uh, at uh, both Petaluma High School and Casa Grande. It's uh, pathways that uh, some of them need strengthening, some of them need additional support, uh, but they are um, currently there. And, and anecdotally, talking to some students in some of these pathways, they, it has transformed their lives. They have they've know exactly what they want to do. They've um, um, thrived uh, in, in the CT environment, and so we're happy uh, that they're able to have that opportunity. We really want to make sure uh, we can continue that uh, at the school sites. Uh, one indicator that we look at to determine um, students' college and career readiness is the college and career um, indicator. And the college and career indicator basically measures how well our schools are preparing students for likely success after graduation. So just from this data, you can see um, we have some work to do, and there are gaps, especially with our subgroups. And then those gaps that we, we are working to help close uh, as we develop our CTE program. What's SWD? Uh, students with disabilities. Okay. Uh, like uh, professional development, uh, career tech education isn't free. Uh, it does cost some money, but fortunately we also have um, um, funding and grants that do support that. Uh, there's a, a, but I think it was 150 million, but the but the state had increased it to another 150 million. So I think there's about 300 million uh, total total allocation for CTIG, um, and I and we're just waiting to see how much of that will be uh, given to us. Um, but we have other funding sources as well to support um, uh, the grant, uh, Perkins, a strong workforce, and and funds from LCFF to support our CTE programs. And with that. I just want to thank you for the opportunity and have any questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I love this team. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. They are a great team. Anyone, anyone have any questions? For anyone? To the answers we want to learn. I have a question. So, um, and we talked about like getting money for professional development at the end. You know, we talked about the different grants. And I mean, like, we can't just throw money at the problem. I mean, we're seeing those huge gaps currently, like, in our schools. So what are we doing about those? What has been done? Um, are you hoping that some of that's, I mean, I know you just got here. All <laughs> y'all just got here. Someone has to put it on you. Um, but have you thought about that? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I look at those numbers, it's, it's what keeps me up sometimes at night. Um, it's, you know, and, and I think the equity study I'm hoping uh, will help reveal some of the systems, because really that's what they're, they're looking at. Are the systems that are, one, creating the successes that we're having, but also what, what are they, also are there any barriers that are keeping some of our students from being able to access um, the programs that we have or succeeding within those programs? So uh, that will help inform us of where we can start focusing. But also, um, you know, you know, as we partner with um, the community colleges, as we partner with the CT Coalition, the CT Foundation, and uh, industries that are supporting some of our CT programs, it's really looking to see how we can um, um, look at that data and work with the school sites and strengthen what is already there, but also encourage um, uh, you know, representation from our students to be able to access those things and make sure that they have access to those things. Uh, so it, it will take not just looking at that data, but also looking at transcripts and, um, and, and reviewing that with counseling staff and to, to work on seeing, you know, our kids, um, how are kids being placed into programs? Or do they have choice when they're, when they're picking their schedules? How does the master schedule support kids having access to those things? Are we creating schedules where kids don't have access to courses because uh, you know, we have singleton courses that are aligned with another course that now they're forced to make a decision with one or mm -hmm. the other. So we can be more mindful of how we um, develop those systems within our master schedule. So there are a lot of little things that will uh, allow us to attack the bigger problem. But, um, but yeah, as you know, this is my fifth month here. It's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely, but it is definitely something important that, that we are, you know, really looking and working on. And so we we'll really take, um, 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 that equity study to really help reveal some of those uh, systematic barriers that I think, I think I, we're seeing. But now we can just kind of hopefully validate and then focus and, and prioritize it. 
That's it for me. Anyone else? No? Thank you. Thank you all for your work. Yeah. Super important. Really appreciate it. All right. Next up, comments from the public on non-agendized items. I read the board policy. Do you guys need a break? Okay, actually, we're going to take a five-minute break. Okay. We'll have the chat open while we're on break. Calling the meeting back to order. All right, so I think we left off with comments from the public on non-agendized items. Do we have anyone? Um, okay, all right. Since I can't see that small writing, yeah, I will let Matthew, if you don't mind calling the people up. Thank you. I'm seeing three, three public comments here. The first one is Sal Andropoulos. Hello. All right, Sal. Hi, um, I'm Sal Andropoulos. Uh, they then pronouns with North Bay LGBTQI families. Um, just uh, wanted to say appreciate, uh, really appreciate the presentation we had this evening uh, regarding professional development and uh, curriculum. Um, and everything that the Ed Services team um, is working on. Um, I just really appreciate all the work that's going into moving all this forward. Um, and so just kind of echoing some of what was um, kind of referenced during the discussion by the school board, just wanna, I guess, reiterate that, especially for um, curriculum updates relating to the experiences and well being of marginalized student groups, including, you know, things like the Fair Actor LGBTQ histories or ethnic studies or health and sex education, which under California law is required to be. LGBTQIA plus inclusive, it's just critical that professional development around cultural responsiveness um, accompany and I guess, and or precede uh, curriculum implementation. Um, and so it's, it's great to see the emphasis on professional development um, in, in all the plans, um, um, but particularly on the cultural responsiveness um, piece, it's just really important for educators to have a chance to develop you know, an understanding not just of the, the subject matter, um, but of the communities at, at, you know, at issue with, with this coursework, which may not be a part of their own life experience, you know, and to address any conscious or unconscious bias that may inform their views uh, regarding these communities so that they can deliver the, you know, the updated curriculum materials in a manner that, that's culturally conscious um, rather than harmful, which is something that, that can happen. Um, and even in areas of like looking at like different curriculum options, it's really, it's, it's important to have this kind of foundation as well, just in terms of like understanding the relevant issues for these communities. So for example, if you're looking at like health and sex ed, you'll be able to identify curriculum options or, or lessons that use gender inclusive language as opposed to options that do not. And that can be quite harmful for some students to like to listen to in those classes. So just really important at, at all points um, in the process. So just, again, very appreciative of, of the presentation and all the work that um, is going into this. Um, and um, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Sal. Next up, we have Renee Ho. Welcome, Renee. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the time. Renee Ho here, pronoun she, her, and ella, and grateful to share space with you all. Um, I'm from Amor Para Todos, which is a local org that works to make our schools more gender and LGBTQI plus inclusive. And I completely uh, mirror Sal and what they spoke to. I specifically also wanted to share in regards to curriculum and professional development trainings. It was really exciting and um, I'm enthusiastic about the funding that the district will receive. And I just wanted to share that um, a more put it those organization would be um, very grateful to be able to share resources and programs that we are currently working in, working on with another school districts within Sonoma County in regards to professional development for anti-bias, gender LGBTQI inclusive PDs for elementary and secondary schools, which are being used throughout um, Sonoma County currently. 
and looking into being adopted um, under the human rights campaign. They're called Welcoming Schools. And I would um, be grateful to share about that. Also, one of our main projects are gender inclusive family life, uh, sex ed, which I believe you all refer to as human um, interaction curriculum um, to ensure that schools are in compliance with what Cal Sal referred to as the California Healthy Youth Act, CHIA. Um, so that is something else I would be more than happy to share with. We have been vetting out programs for about two years and are in touch with one from San Francisco that's pretty amazing. Um, so just, again, always grateful to share space with you all and would really love to meet with anyone that would be willing to share about PDs and curriculum. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Renee. Next up, we have Sarah Brooks Long. Welcome, Sarah. Sarah is not on. Okay, so I'll just read, I'll read her, the comment here. It says, it's frustrating that we're spending $45,000 per school site on an equity study when it could have been used to create smaller classes for students. Smaller classes equals better student performance. And that's the end of the comments. All right, thank you. Next up, we have reports on activities and correspondence of school board members over the last few weeks. Um, North Bay Children's Center fundraiser, um, Mary Collins at Cherry Valley Friends of the Library fundraiser, PCS board office hours at McKinley Pax, McDowell, Cherry Valley, and Grant, McKinley's Dia de los Muertos altars display, Valley Vistas altars display, K-12 curriculum committee meeting, circle up, PCS soccer tournament, and United Anglers fundraiser. Does anyone want to comment on anything that they attended? I'd like to comment a little bit about office hours. Okay. Um, I just want to say that I've done three office hours, and I know I've done a couple with Maddie, and we've all done some, and they've been really wonderful. And I just want to encourage um, parents to come talk to us in our office hours. I believe they're published on the website. Yes. Um, I've talked to parents, I've talked to teachers, I've talked to admin, and it's just, it's really um, important for us to hear concerns of people in the district. So please, if I think we're gonna be at Pengrove tomorrow, um, and I don't know, other than that, I don't know the, the, um, the calendar, but it's on the website. I just want to add that um, I, I echo everything that Ellen has said, and that if you uh, missed a chance uh, for this semester at your school, uh, we'll be visiting all schools next semester. So, um, and we actually had, yeah, so um, come in and join us. Um, it's been it's been wonderful. And I really want to shout out to all the people, if you're listening at all, um, that came to our office hours for the really wonderful responses we've been getting. Um, they, they really made, a, made me think a lot about um, the issues that came up that I wouldn't ordinarily think about. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Hopefully we'll see more folks out at office hours. Thank you guys for bringing that up. All right, next up, comments from the public on consent items. So we're gonna reopen the chat. If you have a comment on anything on the consent agenda, please put your first and last name in the chat and the item that you would like to speak about.
Okay, I think we can close the chat. There are no comments. All right. Um, approval of consent agenda by consolidated motion. I move to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. All right, any questions or comments? I have a question. Um, I was wondering, I was reading about the uh, Hey Tutor, and do we also have um, SSU tutoring as well? Yeah, so the, the SSU tutoring, I think that came last at the last board meeting was was specifically for, I think we, I think I brought it last year and it was specifically for McDowell. They're piloting for McDowell. And so getting some, some tutors, and again, we'd love to expand it, no doubt, no doubt. Students are getting some credit from SSU to do some tutoring. And it was sort of a pilot during COVID. Now let's see how, what, what they can do. Hey, tutor. I'll let Tony speak to that. It's, it's really about the independent study program for right now. Okay, okay. Yeah, so we're just piloting with HeyTutor um, for all the ads and independent studies. Kids in independent study, they, they you know, they uh, are, are middle school and high school students in independent study only have weekly synchronous instruction time. So uh, we know that they, they might need some extra support. So we want to just kind of pilot to see how well uh, the program works for them. And then if, if it's something that's, that seems to be very uh, valuable to and um, and promising that we'll, we'll look into expanding their services with our other schools as well. Yeah, I noticed that it was both online or in person, which I I think is great. I was just wondering what the nexus was between the two tutorings. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Wow. All right. Comments from the public on action items. We'll reopen the chat for another minute or so. If you have a comment on um, any of our action items, please put your first and last name in the chat, chat and what you would like to speak about. Do we have anyone? Nope. I think let's go ahead and close the chat. No, no com, no comments. Okay. Um, action items. Let's see. So this is the regular, right? We have to do every month, holding the meeting in a hybrid fashion. Correct. So. All right. So we, we, you, we read it at the beginning of the meeting, and now it's just time to take action that, yes, we're going to continue on with it's part of it is the discussion around, yes, this is the format of a meeting that we want to continue on with. And, is, and you know, until we until we reach a point where we come back to a normal in person, we have to continue to, to do this once a month, every 30 days. OK. All right. I'll move to approve the board meeting plan. I move to approve the board meeting planning per AB 361. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, Jason, is this you? Yes, this is me. So um, this is a request for uh, an intern for Courtney Peterson as an RSP teacher at San Antonio High School. It's an, another one of those positions that's been hard to fill and we're glad that we're find, have found somebody that's intern ready and is ready to go. Great, all right. 
I'll move to approve the district intern credential request for Courtney Peterson. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Business services. This looks So this resolution is simply this resolution is simply to um, adjust, correct, change staff authorized um, to sign and approve things on behalf of the Board of Education for the State Allocation Board. State Allocation Board oversees all of the facility stuff. So State Allocation Board is not necessarily signed to the budget stuff. This is really about construction matters. So it's simply things like when we want to assign a, a PTN or a project number through the state, they were sending everything to Gary. We need them to send oh, it. No. We need Don't them to send it to Matthew and I. So, oh, so that's all this resolution does is, is it basically authorizes that change. Okay. We move to approve resolution 2122-08. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, Comments from the public on discussion information items? We'll reopen the chat for about a minute. So if you have a comment on any of the discussion slash information items, please put your first and last name in the chat. I think we can close the chat. No comments. All right. Moving on. Item 16.1.1. Jason. So we uh, um, received the first quarter report and everything looked great. <laughs> And nothing much to comment other than great job. Great. Yeah, good. Hey, <laughs> thank Always you. nice to hear that. Yes. Um, all right, item 16.2.1, Chris. Yeah, this is um, uh, the Redwood Empire Insurance Group, Russig's annual mm -hmm. report on, um, on liability claims. So it's, it's, um, it just reports on all of the claims by the members and that they can meet the claims. So it's just the annual report, nothing, nothing unique or significant. Okay. Can Chris, I ask what does, what does undiscounted mean? Does that just mean the, the face value amount that they, they're making a claim for? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole actuarial study and report that's done that basically shows you diff different levels of discount rates that can be applied when they're looking at it. Oh. And so, um, you know, when you have a claim, you don't really know the full amount of the claim. Okay. So contemplate, you know, there's a, a, a water damage or some sort of life. Well, this is really liability, liability claim. So an actuary comes in and basically tries to set a value of what they believe the claim is going to be. And then that's adjusted annually. All right, uh, Tony, this is you, item or section 16.3. And two. Yeah, so that's, um, so Petaluma High School um, had a broadcast journalism course, but uh, the teacher is now CTE certified, and so they want to oh. make it a CTE course and build the pathway for that. Cool. Good to hear. And you just want me going. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so Casa Grande uh, currently does not have an honors math two, and that, that course is really to help on ramp to the honors math three to prepare those kids for honors math three and then eventually, hopefully, higher math after that. Uh, so, currently, they just have math one, math two, and then honors three math. And so, they're really mm -hmm. wanting to, um, to be on the same page with Tyler High School, who, who also has an honors math two, uh, and they want to add it to their course options as well. Okay. Sounds good. And I'm happy to take the this 
16.3.3, the amended board policy on transitional kindergarten. This is essentially um, as we start looking, you know, here in the gover governor's proposal about expanding transitional kindergarten to all four year olds. So we typically, um, the, the guidelines have been September 2nd through December 2nd. We as a district were including students who had birth dates through January 15th. Um, now we're kind of getting ahead of the expanding dates. I believe it's February 2nd, then March 2nd, then April 2nd. We're moving it to April 2nd so we can capture more, some more students and, and um, introduce them to transitional kindergarten for next year. And so the recommendation is to, uh, to change the board policy so that it's expanded out a little bit ahead of the curve and starting to bring in um, some more TK students into our district. I have a question. Um, sure. Will there be a transitional kindergarten at every school? Where we are working through that part of that is that is our ultimate goal. Yes, and it has the only the only impediment, the only barrier is facilities okay. having having the facilities to do so. The reason why I ask is it came up during office yeah. hours. Someone asked me. Also, what about um, instructional assistance for TKs? So is I think yeah, there? I think in the in the new legislation they contemplate um, a certain number of students per adult, which would be a teacher and an instructional assistant in the classroom. Okay. Um, so I I need to read it, read it a little bit closer, but I, I I'm not sure um, when it when that will begin. But yes, right now we do we already have we've got some we have instructional assistants in our um, TK classrooms already. Um, we expanded it this year, okay. um, and so we're anticipating to, to continue that. You know, follow the the. Um, and we expanded it using some of the ELL money. Right. Oh, okay. And, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and I would also say, you know, I think the governor's budget. Yeah, I think the governor's budget proposal in January will hopefully yes. help to inform a little bit what how much the governor is going to commit fin financially. Right. To. Um, to some of the new TK implementation. Okay. And the other thing is, because remember, I think that the first year of implementing for 22-23 is March 2nd. P2 happens in March for our attendance. So making it April 2nd, because you know you don't get funding for a certain period of time for some of those students, but it should be minimal for us because of the way P2 falls. Perfect. So, anyway. Good, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, future business. Anyone have anything for future business? Go ahead, Maddie. Okay. Go ahead. I, I was just, um, when I was at the fundraiser for United Anglers, so um, it was it was really great, you know, and it was it's all student driven. It's it's um, uh, you know it's a it's a program that's been around forever and um, and yet it keeps changing with reality and so I would love to have those students come and give a presentation here and also you know you know just about how they actually um, run this organization and and the fact that all this coho salmon came to uh, to the facility, the hatchery, and now it's growing, the reputation is growing, so they're getting um, a whole new group of, of salmon from um, Santa Cruz. And, um, and so their, their reputation is growing, uh, the, uh, the, their task is changing, I think, a little bit. And so I just think it would be fabulous to have them, and they're, they're so articulate and, um, it's so devoted. inspiring they're totally totally so I, that's just impressive. something i thought about that would be really nice to hear i love that that's yeah. great we yeah. can we I, can certainly make that happen I i'm sorry i'm that. sorry i missed you there we i saw sheldon i didn't see you. oh oh we yeah were, and and ellen was there no, yeah. I, I didn't see you at all it's an amazing 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 program it's yeah. so great and i already told dan so yeah <laughs> Anyone else? I, I do have a, uh, I don't know who to look at on this one. Everyone's like, don't look at me. Um, circle up. So can we have like a check-in? 
like a winter check-in, either December, January, like, is it working? I mean, we talked about, Tony did a great job breaking down, I'm pointing here because he had the presentation up there, restorative practices, conscious conversations, racism uncovered, and those are things that we had talked about, like, we really want those to like, touch our students. Just want to hear more about it. Um, that was something I brought up today at our meeting is how are we measuring the success of this program? Mm -hmm. um, and when, how are we pulling students in? How is it affecting our students? Because I go to meetings every month and I, I'm not sure. <laughs> so I, that's been, I've been kind of putting that question out there already. Okay. It's like, what, how do we measure success with the program? Did you get any yep. answers? Or are you just asking the question? I was just asking the okay. question. I didn't get answers. Okay. We'll, we'll get a presentation out for that sometime in, in, yeah, before the end of the year. That would be great. Okay. Um, anyone else? Future business? All right. All right, that's it. We tend right. to linger on this. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> All right, meeting adjourned. <laughs> oh gosh, you're right. Oh, yeah, okay. <sighs> Wait, where is my paper? Give me a second. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so we are going to report out of closed session. Um, we have two instances to uh, report about and vote on. All right, case number 252-225533. A case has been presented to the board that the student did commit an expellable act as defined by the California Education Code. Prior disciplinary actions have been attempted and were not successful and or due to the nature of the act. The presence of the people causes a continuing danger to the physical safety of the people and others. The recommended motion is for the board to support the site discipline team's recommendation for expulsion in accordance to board policy and to, fa and to facilitate enrollment in a county operated court and community school. The student's expulsion status will be in effect for the fall and spring semesters of the 2021 to 2022 school year. Can I get a motion? Move to support the staff's recommendation for expulsion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Case number 362-225644. A case has been presented to the board that the student did commit an expellable act as defined by the California Education Code. Prior disciplinary actions have been attempted and were not successful and or due to the nature of the act. The presence of the pupil of the pupil causes a continuing danger to the physical safety of the pupil and others. The recommended motion is for the board to support the site discipline team's recommendation for expulsion in accordance to board policy and to facilitate enrollment in a county operated court and community school. The student's expulsion status will be in effect for the fall and spring semesters of the 2021 to 2022 school year. Move to support the staff's recommendation for expulsion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Let me actually make sure I didn't miss anything here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And with that, we are now adjourned.